Hello everybody and a very warm welcome to the latest in this series of Wonka webinars. Today the topic is quality and safety and it will be led by Dr Pilar Astier, Chair of Wonka's Working Party on Quality and Safety in Family Medicine. She's put together a great panel who you'll meet as we go along, but I'd like to offer a special Wonka welcome to Dr Neelam Dingra from WHO headquarters in Geneva. Neelam is head of the patient safety flagship within WHO's Integrated Health Service Division and is a great supporter of Wonka and family medicine. Neelam, you're most welcome. As usual, we'll also be monitoring your questions and comments on both Zoom and Facebook, and we hope that there'll be time for Anna Stavdal to pose at least some of those to the panelists. But without further ado, let me pass over to our Wonka president, Dr. Donald Lee, for his opening remarks. Good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the seventh Wonka webinar. We just celebrated World Family Doctor Day, and I thanked family doctors for sharing the burden of dealing with this COVID-19 global epidemic. Family doctors are continuing with their massively increased workload, but I'm proud of the level of support and collegiality displayed within and across our member organizations and from region to region. Family doctors all around the world disseminate scientific advice, clinical updates, reflective messages, and professional support through their social media links and connections. The Wonka webinar is a platform for all of you to share experiences, relay information, and to keep in touch with each other regularly, like family members, urging courage, offering mutual support in these extraordinary times. Next, please. Patient safety is the cornerstone of high quality healthcare. Quality in healthcare and safe care mean best health outcomes that are possible given the available circumstances and resources consistent with patient centered care. The provision of quality healthcare in a safe environment should be universally available to all people, especially during challenging times which we are facing combating COVID 19. Tonight, we have a panel of distinguished speakers who will identify quality and patient safety issues to improve primary care delivery during the COVID-19 crisis. It will cover a wide range of topics. So without further ado, may I pass on to Pilar, who will introduce the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Lee. A very warm welcome to our well attendees to this Quality and Safety in Family Medicine Wonka webinar. I am Pilar Astier, a Spanish family doctor and the chair of the Wonka World Working Party on Quality and Safety in Family Medicine. First, I would like to thank Wonka World for their extraordinary support to make this webinar possible today. Next slide, please. Second, I am delighted to introduce this wonderful team of family doctors from all over the Wonka regions. They are going to share with you in about three minutes, each one, some key messages of their knowledge and expertise on quality and patient safety issues in primary care while the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. We are going to talk about six quality and safety challenges, team organization, safe use of medications, telemedicine, professional health, community and public health issues, and finally, some practical issues in quality management. Thank you very much, all panelists, for the effort to be brief and concise. We have prepared an appetizer together for you, with the aim to go on learning and improving so that we can all build an excellent and safe primary care, even in crisis situations. I'm giving the floor to Dr. Anna Stadwell, President-elect of Wonka World. Thank you very much, Anna, for your commitment on quality and safety in family medicine. Muchas gracias, Pilar. Um, warm greetings from Norway to everyone. Um, the COVID pandemic works as a magnifying glass. Strengths and weaknesses of our healthcare systems become more visible. It provides us with an opportunity to identify where we can improve in all the domains of family medicine, it being clinical practice, teaching, research, 
or advocacy. Next slide, please. How many doctors continue to do what we always do? Provide care to other populations in accordance with the core values of our specialty. The values which unite us despite global differences in how our services are set up and delivered. We provide continuous, comprehensive and personal care at first point of contact. That is our common denominator and our common point of departure, looking at improvement of health care quality. Next slide. What changes are we going through as we speak? Personal centered medicine used to mean face to face contact using body language and physical contact as important tools in diagnosing and treating disease, in comforting people in crisis, and alleviating pain. Now we need to take preventive measures and reduce physical contact, often looking into the eyes of our patients through a shield or on a screen. For our patients, it means that there is a risk of being left without home visits if you're old and sick. Patients with chronic disease are reluctant to come to the doctor's office in fear of being <clears throat> infected. In previous webinars, we have also learned how mental health issues are increasing during the pandemic, and so is the risk of family violence. Digital diagnostic tools are flooding the market to assistance, but also frustration for patients as well as physicians. That is the environment in which family doctors now look for ways to improve equality and safety. And as always, we need to take not only the doctor's perspective, but also that of the patients and of the policymakers to report back from the field and that way help them to make good decisions. Next slide. But without listening to people, no healthcare quality improvement is possible. So we will listen to you, participants in the audience. During a series of short presentations, we invite you to share questions and observations. We have Jose Miguel Bueno Ortiz and Laura Conangla from Spain monitoring the chat and Ruth Wilson from Canada, the Facebook feed. After the presentation, they will convey questions from you to the panelists. Enjoy the presentations and give us feedback, please. It's now my privilege to welcome David Moores. David, the screen is all yours. Next slide, I guess. Good morning uh, or good day, Wonka colleagues. Canada is the second largest country by land size in the world, but we are only 36 million people. One might say that we are more naturally socially distanced than many other countries. In general, we are 13 publicly funded uh, but privately delivered health systems, much like the NHS England, NHS Scotland, NHS Wales and Northern Ireland. Co-payments and bankruptcies as a result of out-of-pocket expenses are not issues that Canadians have to endure. Next slide. Some 25 years ago, our British colleagues characterized a significant event as any event thought by anyone on the team to which we would uh, add, including patients and their families, be significant in the care or conduct of the practice. Although often bad, it's sometimes uh, more uh, we can learn from uh, the bad than the good or the good than the bad. This is, next slide. This is a quote from our nurse at the McEwen University Health Center, where we look after over 9,000 people. And although the leadership team were looked to for comfort, we, the leadership team, looked to our team for comfort as well. Next slide. So I'm going to give you three significant events that may resonate. The first relates to a system 
the Alberta Health Services developed a contingency plan to close the practice. It was seen as another outpatient clinic in need of closure, but we developed a contingency plan to accommodate this other practice of 5,200 people. Next slide. This is a personal issue. The people on the right have given their permission. The elderly woman is Marge, who's been in my practice for 25 years. Across Canada, seniors in nursing homes have died at significant rates. We don't want mom to go through what has happened in Quebec or Ontario. So we do virtual visits for this woman, but it can only be done because of our team. Next slide. And finally, we wanted you to know that despite our best efforts at screening people, we sometimes are at risk as well as our patients. This was a memo. And uh, from our uh, team and the upside of this was we need to ensure people know that we will look after them no matter what. And now I turn it over to my colleague, Professor Shabir Musa. Hi everyone, thanks, uh, thanks David. Um, I'm really pleased to be here on behalf of Wonka Africa. Um, I think that as a family physician in Africa, a lot of uh, the requirement to be able to develop uh, quality and safety is going to be about how do we reorganize care? And I think just to start by showing you what's going on in Africa, you can see the two hotspots uh, is Egypt and, uh, and South Africa. And the way in which cases are going slowly, they're becoming much more exponential. So what is happening in the US, now South America, could very easily become what is happening in Africa. Next. I think in South Africa as the hotspot, I just need to share some quick background. I think uh, we have a seriously inequitable healthcare system with uh, almost the same amount being spent by 16% of the population as 84% of the population, uh, the rest of the population gets from the public service. Um, private healthcare practitioners as the private primary health care are actually very marginal, only having about 6 to 7% of the spend in private sector. So it's really a very private hospital uh, dominated uh, sector. We have mostly the public service in health districts uh, under provincial control, so it's really not very decentralized. And I, as a public health practitioner, a public family physician, work in that space with really very poor capacity available. Next. So in South Africa, the, uh, the trajectory of, um, you know, of uh, COVID has been um, not quite the same as the rest of the country, uh, the rest of the world. Uh, as you can see, there was an inflection point which happened in our country with a very dramatic lockdown, um, which has been one of the more stronger in the country. Uh, yet, I think we're still not getting ahead of the curve uh, in the sense that it's growing, growing slowly. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see, next, you'll see that in fact, at pro as projections go in South Africa, that we're expecting you know, projections of up to 1.2 million infections. Um, we expect at least, uh, at least uh, in a sort of ballpark of 45,000 deaths. Uh, these uh, projections, uh, everyone qualifies them by saying, while well, they depend on how the, the you know, disease um, uh, you know, sort of evolves over the next few weeks. Uh, but this is clearly in everyone's language as this is going to exceed our capacity, as you can see by the ICU beds, by enormous numbers. So if you go to the next slide, um, I'm going to share with you a little bit of how team reorganization has occurred in one district. So you can see Gauteng is in fact a very small geographic space in the population of 57 million, which as you can see on the right is about 15 million. And right at the middle of Gauteng is the city in which I live, which is called Johannesburg. Um, and in Johannesburg, there are seven sub-districts. And you can see the sub-district D is Soweto. Uh, it is uh, almost a third of the population of Johannesburg. And in that, I provide clinical governance uh, supervision in the 29 facilities in there. Um, I also am linked to the University of Utvartisrand. Uh, but I provide direct care to patients in, in a practice uh, in one of five community health centers in that region 
uh, in a space called Shiawala Community Practice, where I have a population of about 30,000 that I work as a team to provide. So next. What we have found in terms of the public service generally is that uh, we have lots of people coming to very few facilities with very poor physical distancing. And as you can see in that picture, it makes for a very anxious um, situation where staff get very anxious. They don't often have good PPE. They don't manage those queues very well. And in fact, as a result, they've tried to reduce services, which is a real problem for our long-term health. Next. So in terms of how we address that, initially in the public service in Gauteng, uh, the health service said, you know, we basically are going to go around and find contacts of people we've identified, usually at hospitals or by virtue of um, them being picked up in the private sector. And so it was a very strong public health orientation that stopped at a sub-district level, on paper almost. And at clinics, we said, but this is not going to address the problem because everyone walking in with a cough and a cold despite the travel history, could potentially have COVID. Um, so we set up a process at the facility itself and uh, essentially saying that we need to reorganize the facility to cater to dealing with um, uh, uh, COVID patients in what we call a temperature chest clinic, reaching out into the community and trying to establish how we can work with as a partner with the community in education, but also the community of workers going out and finding patients as well as educating in terms of protection. And then we thought we would link up with the sub-district effort, both in terms of supporting the facility as well as integrate with this public health approach. We used a similar thing to, similar idea with the private GPs to provide them some advice. Next. But if you look at it, we basically set up, you know, trying to get work with the team, three sort of zones. Uh, trying to manage the queue outside with physical distancing, getting a single point of entry, some sanitation, and then a very simple screening with community of workers that try to decide, you know, with a few questions that we screen with, do these patients have any symptoms? And if they do, then they go into an area we call orange, usually something that were, we set up as a chest clinic, and then an, a, uh, the rest of the service would continue. And this was a way in which we would manage, uh, you know, the staff patients as well as continue uh, the services and increase the testing. Next. So it has been quite challenged. Uh, it has worked quite well in certain spaces. Um, and as you can see, it uh, takes a lot of paint, with tape and the like, but these resources are challenged. Uh, go next. So in terms of, next. In terms of progress, we've set up about seven, um, seven facilities. Um, 11 facilities, and these have been the large community health centers across the city. Um, but our challenges remain, if we are going to scale it up and cover all 130 facilities across the city, we need testing, uh, you know, arrangements to be clarified, materials, staff to be aligned to the purpose, and other things like that. So this has been a focus of our training in the last few weeks. Thanks. So with that, I think, you know, there's some resources we put out as well to guide the community and uh, um, you know, the, the other team members. Uh, and this is available to our partners, it's become quite a powerful way to manage the process. So with that, let me hand over, I'm not sure whether um, David will take it on, but uh, thank you very much. That's the team that's produced it, but let's hand over to Neelam, perhaps you can share W2 Insights. Thank you, Neelam. Good afternoon, everyone. Could I have the next slide, please? So um, I'm going to speak about the WHO Global Patient Safety Challenge as an initiative, particularly on medication without harm, and the tools which WHO has developed to address medication-associated harm. Next, please. WHO has launched the challenge of uh, uh, selecting a topic which uh, poses a major and a significant health risk to patients. And these challenges have been uh, to implement proven interventions in a specified area. So, so far, WHO has issued three challenges to the global community. The first challenge was on clean care is safe care, and which actually brought uh, the five moments of hand hygiene, which is very, very uh, familiar to all of you. And this actually is extremely important in current scenario for promoting hand hygiene universally. Next, please. The second challenge was launched to address the unsafe surgical practices, and it was called as Safe Surgery Saves Lives. 
and it led to development of a surgical safety checklist to uh, create a, a, some sort of tool which could help uh, surgeons around the world to have a structured approach to surgery. And this also has been an extremely successful challenge. Next, please. Uh, in 2017, WHO launched their third challenge, uh, which is the Medication Without Harm Challenge. And we have uh, provided a framework of four domains under which we are urging countries and partners to take action. And these are patients and the public, healthcare professionals, medicines as products, and the systems and practices of medication. Next, please. This challenge was launched uh, in 2017 at the second Global Ministerial Summit on Patient Safety. And, and this uh, has ultimate objective to reduce, uh, reduce uh, avoidable harm related to medications up by 50% over a period of next five years. Next, please. As part of this challenge, WHO has developed several tools and guidance to support countries and work with partners to implement the challenge. And one of the most important uh, 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 challenge a tool we have developed is a campaign a toolkit uh, in which we have given a campaign of for patients as well as for healthcare professionals uh, no check and ask before you take it and no check and ask before you give it and this has been very very effective and i would urge all the members of onca to implement this campaign in their health facilities next please in addition who has also developed a patient engagement and empowerment tool the five moments for medication safety uh, starting, taking, adding, reviewing, and stopping, which is STARS in, in English as a mnemonic. And this uh, primarily gives uh, questions which the patients should ask their healthcare professionals and doctors to, uh, to engage with them and to understand about the medication and what, how should they make sure that medication practices and the use they're following is safe. Next, please. And this uh, tool is also available as a, a mobile application, WHO MedSafe. Next, please. And so a couple of other resources with WHO has developed for medication safety or patient, patient safety solutions for localized sound alike medications, control of concentrated electrolyte solutions, and also assuring medication accuracy of transition and scare. And another initiative of HiFi projects also uh, developed several tools related to medication reconciliation. Next, please. WHO has urged countries to prioritize three key action areas. Action on these will significantly reduce medication-related harm. And these are transitions of care, high-risk situations, and polypharmacy. Next, please. So I hand over to Pilar now. Thank you very much, uh, Nilan. Well, regarding who key actions on medication without harm challenge, we can consider the COVID-19 pandemic is a high-risk situation because there is a lack of evidence regarding treatments, there is a big change on the way we visit patients, and there is a high impact on the community. Next, please. Regarding a safe use of medication in primary care, there is no specific therapy approved until now for mild to moderate COVID-19 patients. Nevertheless, hydroxychloroquine chloroquine and isotromacine that are the quite common in primary care might cause harm and we should be aware about this harm. Next, please. There is no current scientific evidence on the effectiveness of other support treatments for COVID-19 mild to moderate patients. In relation to anticoagulants, their use is oriented to prophylaxis of thromboembolism Bronchodilators have no routine role for the management of COVID-19. Corticosteroids are not recommended for viral pneumonia. And regarding NSAIDS, we do not have confirmatory clinical data until now. Next, please. So when a COVID-19 patient is discharged from hospital, we as family doctors, are in charge of their follow-up. There are some issues we have to talk about in our practices for a safe use of medication, which treatment to maintain after discharge and for how many days, and recognize COVID-19 side effect after discharge. 
planning complementarities to control side effects due to treatments? And is there a need for palliative care as well? Next slide, please. We should not forget a safe use of medication for chronic conditions. Many patients take several medications. Family doctors should be aware with regard to the accessibility of medications and ensure safety medication intake by answering any questions that may arise with patients and caregivers. Next, please. Some tips, a stay home message for your surgeries, agreeing on common recommendations for the treatment of COVID patients in the team, ensuring a safe medication, using at least five letters when searching for a medication in an electronic system, Consider to support patients, families, and informal caregivers on a safe use of medication. Be aware of pharmacovigilance issues during pandemic. Do not forget to report to the reporting and learning system on patient safety, any issue regarding medications, including COVID-19. Next, please. Finally, Keep updated on a safe use of medication as scientific evidence is evolving very fast during this pandemic. Thank you for your attention and I'm giving the floor to Dr. Nilan Dingre again. Thank you, Pilar. Next, please. So Pilar and I would like to conclude this session on safe use of medications by saying patient safety comes first when using medications. Next, please. And we urge all of you to join us in achieving medication without harm. More information about the, this challenge, as well as the WHO patient safety flagship and different initiatives is available on WHO website under health topic patient safety. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And I hand over to Professor Donald Lee now. Thank you. I'm sure everyone would agree there's been a lot of use of internet medicine, telemedicine, and so forth. So we'll spend the next few minutes talking about safety and quality issues. Next, please. Advances in technology can impact on quality and safety provision of online healthcare, providing solutions to present difficulties and challenges. But it can also create further legal, ethical, and social concerns. Technology can provide solutions by aiding doctors in making better diagnosis at a distance and have proven valuable during the COVID-19 epidemic. Next, please. <clears throat> the medical profession will need to consider how they can best adapt to internet practices using technology, policy, and legislation, and consumer education to adequately protect the patient. Any adaptation, however, should not lower the established medical standards and hence put patients at potential risk. Next, please. The global risks to the health and well-being of everyone dictate that ethical codes of conduct and regulatory frameworks need to be constantly reviewed and updated, not only to address online medical practitioners, but also other players that facilitate this commercial activity. Appropriate ethical guidelines and regulation should be aimed at technologists, delivery specialists, and financial institution credit in the stream of online medical commerce. Next, please. The need to protect consumers from potential harmful consequences of online consultation should be a core principle guiding the conduct of all commercial entities. Perhaps the only way forward into the future is for more international consensus, cooperation, and agreement to establish global ethical and regulatory standards for online medical practice to safeguard medical practitioners and recipients of medical advice and treatment. So now, the chair of our Wonka eHealth, Dr. Pramantha Prasad Gupta, will continue our presentation. Pramantha. Thank you, Dudal. I'm going to speak on benefits and challenges in the implementation of telemedicine eHealth related to COVID-19. Next slide, please. The primary care physicians are working tirelessly in the front lines at ground zero. Next slide, please. 
Next slide, please. So I'm going to start with some case scenarios in which we can use telemedicine, like a patient with mild respiratory symptoms need evaluation, but has been told not to go to the emergency room. Second scenario, a provider has been quarantined due to COVID-19, but can continue to see patients from their home via virtual visits. The third scenario, a patient with severe symptoms of COVID-19 is hospitalized and needs a specialty consult with an infectious disease doctor in a remote location. Those are the scenario where most of the telemedicine is benefited when it is used. Next slide, please. So we can use telemedicine to prevent overcrowding in emergency department, urgent care clinics, and primary care clinics. We can use teleconsultation as a triage. We can address the ongoing healthcare needs of patients with chronic illness to reduce in-person clinical visits. And we can use telemedicine can bring specialty care services to patients being cared for in areas without access to such care, both domestically and internationally. Next slide, please. So there are the four challenges. Those are administrative engagement, where there are the issue of financial conditions we are going to pay. There are the physician engagement, where every country has its own laws, policy, ethics, the e-prescriptions law, and multi-jurisdictional licensure. Then there is the infrastructure engagement, where there is issues like connectivity issues, like broadband, training of staffs, hardware agnostics, and sustainability engagement where reimbursement by payers next slide please so those are the action which we can take to expand telemedicine availability during the covid 19 pandemic so where we can lose privacy regulation like most of the countries like india japan south korea and many more other countries had already its restrictions on telemedicine and mobile health to treat covid 19 patients remotely we can allow phone visits to qualify as telemedicine. We can allow clinicians to practice across state lines. We can allow patients to access service from their homes and waiving the need for pre-existing relationship. Next slide, please. So I will conclude by saying that telehealth is bridging the gap between people, physicians, and health systems, enabling everyone, especially symptomatic patients, to stay at home and communicate with physicians through virtual channels, helping to reduce the spread of the virus to mass population and the medical staff on the front line. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I will hand over to Harris now. Thank you very much, Pramendra, uh, for the introduction. My name is Harris Lizidakis, and I would like to, to talk to you about the digital health assessment framework that Wonka has recently introduced. Uh, the evaluation of digital health application is becoming increasingly important to improve their quality, to ensure patient safety, and to strengthen public and professional trust. Wonka can play a pivotal role in developing a certification program, ensuring the services, technologies, organization, and implications of a product and provider meet specific standards, our values, and principles. So, driven by our guiding principles, we uh, performed a, um, a research, performed a desk research on topics uh, which may be important for the assessment of digital solutions uh, from the perspective of family doctors. And an initial set of topics was created, was gathered and clustered into 11 thematic domains, uh, reflecting in, uh, 112 it in a 112 item questionnaire. Uh, we then ran a pilot uh, together with uh, the Pingang a Good Doctor uh, company uh, and in order to um, uh, assess the, um, and judge the conformity according to uh, the standards that we set. Now this framework includes 11 domains of evaluation ranging from user aspects to healthcare system and ethical matters. Uh, the ratings are translated in uh, outcomes along uh, three dimensions, uh, the comprehensiveness of the services provided, the scalability to other settings, countries, and healthcare systems, and the validity and availability um, of evidence, such as cost-effectiveness. 
a traffic light style rating method is employed to judge the three, di to judge the three dimensions as an indication for the level of conformity with the Wonka standards per dimension. So we will be further developing the assessment framework uh, with the help of the eHealth party and other partners. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Andre Rosford and Professor Amanda Howie, who will be leading the next uh, session of uh, our webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harris. And good afternoon, everybody from Ireland. Uh, quality of care. Well, what is quality of care? Let's remind ourselves. There are many definitions to quality of care, and I've listed some of the dimensions here. Since COVID began, we've been all very busy with clinical risk management and focusing on quality and safety in patient care. But COVID has put a fresh emphasis on the dimension of clinician health and safety at work, the management of work-related risks for healthcare workers. And we all hear the stories of colleagues with serious uh, illness, COVID-related illness, and indeed many have died. It reminds us of the Dublin Declaration on Patient Safety uh, from 2017 at the EQUIP conference, which states clearly that healthy doctors are needed for safe patient care. So in this section on professional health, I will discuss personal protection and protection of the team. And Amanda will discuss protecting patients and professional organizational safety issues. So here we aim to give you just a taster presentation of a future full webinar on this topic. Next slide, Harris, please. Courage is the first of human qualities because it is the quality which determines the others. And that's a very profound statement from Aristotle and very relevant to us now. We've all witnessed the widespread public appreciation being expressed by the public in recent months for the dedication and for the brave healthcare workers doing their jobs all over the world dealing with uncertainty and with serious risk of contracting the virus themselves and also spreading it to loved ones. That appreciation has also been for everyone working in family medicine, where more than 80% of the infection is managed. This quotation tells us if we're going to be caring and compassionate, if we're going to diagnose and give expert advice during COVID, we need to be courageous and resilient. And this lighthouse is a symbol of that courage, standing strong against the waves that crash into it, but also shining out a light to help and support people in difficulty. It's a symbol of safety. Next slide, please, Harris. Personal protection from infection is key in 2020 medicine. With many people asymptomatic, this can also be a real dilemma. We've been postponing or avoiding procedures that are risky. We've been using PPE for face-to-face -face care and using added protection for our staff. It's really important in these stressful, busy times of telemedicine not to neglect our basic physiological needs of water, food and sleep. Psychological health and well-being is so important for patients as well as for family medicine staff. And the experts tell us that this will be even more important in the future, as there is an increasing incidence of patients with anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder following their own experiences of COVID. Remember, these are our patients too. It looks like the model of the COVID pandemic is more of a marathon than a sprint. Well, of course, family doctors are resilient, but these are unusual circumstances. We know that education and training can help develop resilience while meaningful purpose and values and a good social network can help to nurture it. My college, the ICGP, for example, has been supporting GPs through COVID by coordinating latest expert data and guidance and distributing it through email notifications and the website and webinars. One of these streams has been self-care bulletins for GPs and advice on sickness absence and returning to work has also been coordinated because many cl clinicians in family medicine have their own illnesses and may be taking medication, for example, that may reduce immunity of that healthcare worker to infections. 
And I think the key message here is GP care for GPs and for practice staff is vital. Next slide, please, Harris. Thank you. I think we need to acknowledge when we're talking about protecting the practice team that many GPs are solo GPs, single-handed, right across the world in both rural and urban settings. And these GPs have particular risks of professional isolation and potential burnout. COVID is very challenging for them and so is teamwork. But like all of us in group practices or in solo general practice, we need to be innovative and we need to coordinate tasks with other members of staff and indeed with other practices nearby or virtually with other practices that are more distant to us. We can look to sharing on call, covering each other for absences or for fatigue when we may need to take time out and look at developing a shared rota for keeping each other up to date from reliable sources and managing the information overload that's coming our way. It's okay to be worried. It's okay to ask. And if we can include everybody in the practice team in clear briefings, know who to go to for decisions and coordination and look at workload distribution. And risk stratification has to happen for staff as we do for patients so that the least vulnerable staff do the, do, do the most face-to-face. -face. So I'll just finish with call your family doctor and let's remember World Family Doctor Day 2020. We are on the front line. And at this point, I'd like to hand you over to Amanda Howe. Thank you, Andre. Greetings, everybody. Um, some of what I'm going to say is more like a summary at this stage because some of the points have been made already. But one of the big things that we've had to pay attention to in every country is how to protect the patients from uncertain risk. And in the UK and England where I work, of course, general practices have stayed open. And of course, it's been an absolute priority to maintain patient access to healthcare. But in the initial phase of the COVID crisis, we've altered how we do consultations so that all our patients are being triaged by phone before they have any possible face-to-face -face contact. Sometimes as time's gone on, we've already started using online request forms. We are using a software called Footfall, where if people can fill in the reasons why they want the contact, how to give the contact, what they're expecting, when they can be called back, then by the time I'm looking at that as the GP, a lot of them have already been answered by other people. And that's very simple, asynchronous way of putting in that first request. Then we can proceed to phone, video consultation, emailing, sending photos in if it's a rash or something like this. And this is helping us really to get the message to people, don't come down to the clinic first. If they do come to the front door, the front door is shut. And as Shabir was saying, we have, you know, screening and temperature checks, and we're only allowing people in who we've already agreed can come down or if we're absolutely sure that they are safe to come in. In addition, in terms of protecting patients, as with most countries, the UK spent a lot of energy on risk stratification and we have a group called shielded if people don't know about that they can look on the nhs website who are the most vulnerable and there's been a lot of clinical discussion about that group because you know some people who are older very fit but age is a factor some people younger chemotherapy patients dialysis patients you know and this group are being very restricted in their access and again as practice we've had to think well for them you know, how do we keep in touch with them? We're making more proactive calls. We're also saying if we need home visits, you know, we will go in full PPA and we will have to do that for those people because they are the most vulnerable. And finally, we've seen a big reorganization in the clinics across the different cities or different regions in England, like Shabir was describing in Johannesburg, where we've got some areas that are called hot hubs, not necessarily the hospital, but a clinic with enough space, entrances, protected areas, full PPE to see patients who may have COVID before they are sent to the hospital. 
and cold clinics so that there are also places where we think as much as possible patients won't have been contacted and staff won't get contacted by the time they actually come face to face. So these are some of the ways we've adapted and we think that some of these will continue. Next slide, please. The other thing is we've had to think very hard as Wonka member organisations like me and the Royal College of GPs and my colleagues about what we can offer our colleagues, um, our members, their staff, their patients. We've also set up a lot of resources, a lot of energy has gone into these e-learning hubs and they are open to view at the moment. So please, if you want to see the kinds of things we've been doing, well-being, uh, clinical advice, protection advice, have a look at the college resource hub. The college has really been advocating as well. In primary care, we didn't get the testing and the PPE straight away that we should have done. There was a big national debate about that. And our leaders in the college have been really strong in advocating for what the members and their clinics and their staff need. We've been trying to help with the challenges of the workforce, training people up quickly, helping people who return to practice to help with the COVID practice to get up going quickly and clo working closely with other stakeholders, particularly public health, particularly the other professional bodies, so that we've got a collective overview and a collective interface with government without being inefficient, because everybody is working really hard and we don't want to have 17 conversations where one will do. And again, we're hoping that those partnerships will help us as we move forward. We're already talking about recovery from this phase and reconstruction although as somebody said you know it's going to be a marathon it's not just a sprint so that ongoing collaboration i think has been really important thank you very much i will now hand over to jacqueline ponzo and patricia for the questions around community Sorry, hello everybody, I'm from Brazil. I will talk with Jacqueline about the main challenges of community intervention in the context of COVID-19. Next slide, please. We base it in three main axes. The first one, surveillance, not only for the new cases of COVID, but also other complex cases that are under our responsibility, like chronic conditions or patients with some mental health issues. The second axis, a communication, uh, because quality of information is essential at this time of many uncertainties that we are living. And the third one, solidarity networks, essential to support social weakness in this moment. Next slide. Uh, bringing correct information and fighting fake news are part of the community approach at this time. You can use social media, flyers, WhatsApp, angels, podcasts on community radios, very common here in Latin America. The content of the information should range from health information, uh, hygienic, to information about epidemic numbers in the community. Here in Brazil, communication about local numbers is being essential for us to be able to convince the population uh, of big communities how the importance or what is the big importance of the social isolation. Next, please. Another, uh, another important point is the increase of domestic violence mainly against women due to intense family life. So it's essential that primary healthcare professional be aware of this problem. Here in Brazil, uh, the community health workers, in addition to active uh, searching, for, for, for searching for people with respiratory symptoms, are taking a careful look at warning signs of uh, regarding violence. To deal with this problem, we need to active social support networks in the community. The elderly is also a population at risk for COVID and therefore they need help uh, with their daily activities such as food, groceries or purchase medicines. They also need help to chat and talk with friends and family using social media. So the healthcare team must connect them with solidarity networks. In addition, it's important to be aware of signs of loneliness and increased risk of suicide and to seek support in the community itself. 
COVID bring a new challenge to primary healthcare and like making shared decision or delivering difficult news from distance. So we, we as professional primary healthcare professionals, we must learn new skills mainly related to patient communication mediated by new technology. Next slide, please. Uh, another important is, com is community mental health. Its demand is increasing now. There is a lot of fear and stress due to confinement and uncertainties about life. In addition, many families will have to deal with the death of loved ones, with insignificant financial loss, and many are also essential workers like drivers, supermarket workers, cleaning personnel. Therefore, teams must be prepared and offer alternative for remote mental health care. Next slide, please. Last but not least for us uh, is the issue of social isolation in suitable places, especially in our countries or in countries that have many areas with high population density, so it is difficult to do social isolation in such communities. In this sense, Building partnership with the social assistant secretariat to provide adequate place for centralized isolation of mild case of COVID is an alternative and it's being used in several countries with good evidence. It's also necessary to offer masks and alcohol gel to people who are unable to buy it and that's very common. Next slide. Thank you very much. I would like to introduce the next speakers, Lisha Roberts and Gina Usta. Hello. Perfect. Zina, you can go on. Hello. Greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, uh, the connection is so poor, I'm not able to go on video. Um, first slide, please. Uh, there's no doubt that the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has pushed the healthcare system and, uh, and even the patients uh, uh, in services, uh, to, to deliver services in very unfamiliar way. And uh, patients and healthcare providers were both unprepared in this new um, the telemedicine lacks essential aspects of patient evaluation and this is why it may be considered a bit to be substandard. Like for example, we cannot do a physical exam, we're not able to access the, uh, we're not able to uh, notice the nonverbal cues and even in the private sector, the healthcare team is not available. It got disconnected because of the lockdown and the the network has to be rebuilt. Next slide, please. Uh, even in many places, electronic health records is not available. When taking a history using the telemedicine, many times we have to rely on the patient's understanding of their diseases, on what they recall medication's name are, and even the lab uh, results, they are being recalled from memory and most probably they may be inaccurate. Even the scans that are being sent on uh, web or on internet, they, are, they may be uh, poorly done and therefore you cannot see the results pretty well. Many people are also uh, relying on paper records. This is why it, uh, the, uh, the, the patient's file is not all good. The documentation is uh, poorly done sometimes as, uh, because of the lockdown. You have to write it on a piece of paper and then you have to wait till you are able to access the patient's file and then record them on the paper. Many people are uh, now, the physicians are now using Google Docs to uh, store online the medical encounters, but that creates a major concern on safety of the information being stored there. Next, please. Uh, uh, this and the med uh, medical encounter rely on two senses, the vision and the auditory. Uh, the auditory is not the auscultation. It is basically what we listen uh, when we take the patient's history. And these also have uh, some limitations. When I'm looking at the patient uh, using my screen, I wonder whether he has jaundice or uh, he is pale. 
uh, is the this lesion that he's showing me, skin lesion, is it elevated or is it flat? Is it loculated or is it hard? Sometimes uh, the, uh, the diagnostic are not always accessible because of the lockdown. People may not go there either because of lockdown or they are afraid of getting uh, COVID. And even the financial situation many times may not allow them to go and uh, request and or do blood, uh, blood tests. Therefore, we rely also on patient-generated data. They have to take their own blood pressure. They have to take their own uh, dextrose stick which, or temperature, which raises concern about the appropriateness of the doses and the re uh, reasonability of the decisions we are taking. In addition, we have to operate with guidelines that have been done not using for uh, normal days when uh, we were not using telemedicine. And we wonder whether these guidelines do apply in uh, these times when uh, telemedicine is being used. And maybe a, uh, a good thing to do is to start having developing guidelines and algorithms. This is something that probably we can work on uh, with uh, WUNCA. Now, one more thing that may affect the safety and the quality of the encounter is basically the privacy. In lockdown, uh, how much can we make sure that the patient is private? Uh, is ha we're having a private encounter the, uh, with the patient. To what extent can we con ask uh, intimate questions, questions like about family violence? Definitely we cannot. Next, please. And uh, there, if there's still places where we're doing face-to-face -face medical encounter. Now, the face-to-face -face medical encounters are limited to urgent cases, and usually it is by appointment. There is phone triaging uh, to rule out possibility of COVID and access the urgency accuracy of phone triaging is uh, variable. Even when COVID is suspected, the sensitivity and, the, and specificity of the available test is variable, and therefore it is something to be considered, whether with the patient who is presenting with a negative COVID test, to what extent they are uh, definitely negative. There is always the possibility of false negatives. Uh, there are also some clinics who cannot re, uh, re, uh, comply or commit to um, uh, provide preventive measures in addition to there is sometimes inconsistency on how preventive measures are to be done. And this poses problems for hygiene and increase the chance of infectivity. Now I leave the floor to Dr. Rich. Thank you, Janan, and, and thank you, Harris. Uh, it probably feels like we've all been drinking from a fire hose today. And so my job in wrapping up is to try to bring this all together in a practical way that we can use in our practices. Uh, Donald Lee reminded us at the beginning of the Wonka definition of quality. And in fact, uh, the working party put together a book a few years ago that gives lots of examples of different approaches to quality and quality improvement uh, strategies. Next slide, please. And one helpful way to think about this conceptually is to perhaps use the model developed by Professor Don Abadian. And what he described were three kinds of measures or attributes to healthcare. One is structural measures, process measures, and outcomes measures. And they are all interrelated. And I'll go through some examples of those uh, with the next slide. So when you look at structural measures, it's assessing a practice's capacity or systems to provide high quality care. So for instance, we cannot provide high quality care in an environment where patients with COVID are presenting without having adequate personal protective equipment for us and for the patients. And yet, how do we do that? Well, one strategy from Japan is called Kanban, and it's a very clever way of uh, keeping up your inventory so you know if there's a mask that you need, it will be there. Uh, is the facility safe? Do we have a way of separating unwell from other patients? Uh, one uh, single-handed family doctor outside of Melbourne built a new clinic and one door was for people with symptoms like COVID and the other door was for everybody else. And the door for the people with uh, COVID symptoms, and this was back when he was doing it for SARS when he built it, uh, basically went into an airlock and then into a waiting area that was a uh, negative pressure area. So again, there are lots of clever ways to make sure our facilities uh, do, do as good as they can for us. Um, the next slide talks about process measures, and that's focusing on actually how the care is provided. And so for instance, with regard to COVID, uh, how many of us are keeping track of how many patients we have that are receiving testing 
for uh, either the SARS virus uh, with the nasopharyngeal swabs or uh, blood antibody tests, and how many of those convert positive. Uh, what proportion of our patients are vulnerable and maybe need more active outreach instead of waiting for this, them to call us or to log on to do an electronic visit? Are we reaching out to them? Next slide, please. And outcomes measures, uh, undoubtedly the most important, attracts uh, what our in interventions do in the health status of our patients. And so, in, for instance, uh, you could measure how many patients die of COVID-19 in your practice. It's always struck me as ironic that with all the many things we measure in healthcare, we very rarely measure deaths in a, in a family doctor's office. Uh, and that's because it tends to be a relatively low frequency event, but it's hard to know if we're doing better or worse without keeping track of some data. And, and it, not everything is about COVID. We're gonna have patients who delay or defer care that will uh, down the road be developing strokes or heart attacks because their blood pressure's on and uncontrolled. And so we need to keep all of this in mind as we juggle these many things. Next slide, please. So where do we start? Well, you can get uh, ideas about where you might wanna focus your efforts to improve and measure your quality from things like patient complaints. If patients are not showing up in your practice because they're afraid or because they don't like sitting next to somebody that's coughing, uh, that's important to listen to and to try to make changes. Um, you can do it by asking your staff and keeping a registry in your staff of uh, the things that patients are presenting with. There are many, many guidelines out there, probably too many, frankly. Uh, the number of uh, periodicals and, and other uh, writings on COVID have been overwhelming in these last four months with something like 100,000 articles now in the peer-reviewed literature. Um, so it's very hard to keep up and the guidelines keep changing about every 15 minutes anyway. Do you wear a mask? Do you not wear a mask? And our job as family doctors is to do the best we can to stay current and more importantly perhaps to reassure our patients that we're going to be there for them even as the what, what the truth seems to be may shift as time as more information comes in. And then, of course, we also have policymakers or those that pay for care, and they have their own requirements about what quality projects we should be working on and what measurements we should be using. Uh, there's a global one, uh, PHCPI, which is Primary Healthcare Performance Indicators. It involves WHO, Gates Foundation, and others. Uh, they're developing a list of numerous indicators. But what I'm going to say to you at the next slide is you got to pick one. You can develop 5,611 different indicators of your quality and you're going to accomplish nothing. So I'm going to say it a second time. Pick one if you're going to start to take this seriously and improve your quality. Next slide, please. And when you do identify that one thing that you want to work on to better understand, you know, how am I doing and how can I do better, uh, there's from industrial engineering and statistics, there are models like the plan, do, study, act model. I'm sure many of you have been exposed to this, but it's a fairly straightforward way of getting your practice organized, working as a team to identify and then remedy problems in the practice. And I would encourage you to uh, listen in on the webinar sessions we're going to be doing in the future where we'll get into all of these in greater depth. We don't have time to do fishbone diagrams or Delphi techniques or anything like that today. Next slide. And so I'm going to leave you with this one slide and say for the third time, pick one thing. Our days are a blur of patients that we're seeing both in person and in increasingly and sometimes uh, mostly uh, electronically, uh, but we still take care of people one at a time. And by that, we also then take care of their families one at a time, which means that we're taking care of our communities one at a time. And consequently, with all the world's family doctors, taking care of the world all together. And sometimes I think that gets lost as we get so focused on incubation periods and transmission rates and all the other things that are certainly important, but we still have more people around the world dying of uh, things like violence and malnutrition and heart disease and on and on and on. And so while COVID is certainly very important, as family doctors, we're, we're, we understand fully that it's not the only thing we do or even the only thing that's important. So with that, I'd like to hand off to uh, Dr. Anna Stavdahl, our Wonka president-elect. Thank you very much, Rich, and thank you for such brilliant presentations a lot of information we will not check out the input from our audience 
and I'm calling Spain. Are you ready to convey a question to our panelists? And we will do it this way. You will, you will address one of the panelists with the question. If the rest of you panelists want to reply or respond to the question, give me a sign. So I will make sure you will have the floor or the screen afterwards. So Jose, you. there, and do you have a question for one of the panelists? Yes, we, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, some of our webinar participants are worried because of the care we neglect to patients who are afraid of catching coronavirus and do not come to the health center or to, the, to our practice. So what do you think we should do and how could we mm, organize our agenda in terms of time to try to contact those who are ill we know them and they are not coming. Okay, so who, who do you think would be the first one, to, the best one to, to respond to this question? Could be uh, David Moores, please. David Moores. We can't hear you. Mm -hmm. No. You must unmute yourself. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. My apologies. I, I was about to say, could you repeat the question? But I, I think what we've discovered in the McEwen University Health Center is despite our initial screening and so on, there appears to be a message that we don't want to see you. We're in the last couple of weeks, we're toying with changing that message. We want to see you. The question is how, and the question is how to protect you because the public is afraid of coming to hospitals and doctors and uh, health centers and so on. Uh, but we will work towards this issue. So we have actually capitalized on uh, the virtual visit uh, as our colleague uh, mentioned, uh, the, the very notion that people are more available. Uh, we, we've had patients in our practice say to us after COVID-19 has settled, will you continue to provide this extraordinary service? Any, any other panelists who have ideas to share with, with the audience uh, as a response to this question? We can allow one more response to this question before we go on. Marla. If I might, Anna, um, one of the yeah. things that I think is very exciting as I uh, talk to friends and colleagues around the world is uh, family medicine is so, uh, of necessity, is so innovative. And I'm seeing things uh, that people are sending me, everything from drive-up service in your car to uh, change in the way that you approach home visits, sometimes doing the home visit outside the, the home and through the window to... Um, one doctor in Michigan was talking about, uh, he, he's used his electronic record system to track people that have not come in that should have, and they're actually doing active outreach with daily phone calls if necessary. So I, I think the, the genius of family doctoring is that we figure out a way to make it work and to stay connected to people. That's, that's our challenge, and it's not an easy one, but it's also probably what we do better than any. Did I see your hand, Patricia? Did, did I see your hand? No? I think, I think Mirella, sorry, Anna, for hijacking the yeah. conversation. It was Mirella. Okay. Hi. <laughs> okay, yeah, there you are. Yeah, I saw, yeah. Hi, I, and you touched on it already, Richard, but I, um, as we sort of move into more looking after our chronic disease management patients, the two T's, teams and technology, um, if you have it. And, and, and that's sort of what we've started doing at our four clinics is, is having team members reach out to those vulnerable patients, um, having lists created by the EMR automatically of, of, you know, the patients that haven't been in, the ones with uncontrolled hypertension and, and A1Cs that haven't been done in, in so long. And then the team members can reach out, start that outreach um, with, 
a little bit, take as much work away from the physician as we can uh, so that um, the physician can do the more important stuff. Thank you very much. Ruth, how are you doing on Facebook? Any well, Facebook to yeah. see the panelists? It's wonderful to see the number of uh, family doctors from around the world who've signed on to Facebook and many of them are expressing appreciation for the for the webinar, realizing that as many have said, it's just a small taste of the issues that we might discuss. I'm going to ask Pilar, our leader, one question, uh, which is which has been posted. Um, what's what's a, a good example or some of the best examples of following Rich Roberts uh, advice and picking one thing? What are some of the um, uh, innovations in quality that that you've heard of or are seeing of people picking one thing to focus on? Well, uh, thank you very much, Ruth, for your work on, on the Facebook, and thank you for the question. Uh, well, regarding uh, the COVID pandemic situation, I think uh, primary care doctors will have to to make sure we are using uh, medicate. We, we have we are. Um, Mm, using medication in a safety way means uh, as uh, evidence is changing so quickly we sometimes we have the temptation to do something or to prescribe any drug and we have to uh, have in mind to be aware that that medication can cause as well harm so we have to be quite aware uh, of what are mm, prescribing for patients so in this uh, COVID pandemic I will um, I will suggest uh, practices to have a safe medication leader, a kind of safe medication leader, is yes, to collect uh, the update of uh, medications for the team and then to uh, agree in a consensus in a safe use of medication recommendation along the pandemic. I, I think in this pandemic, uh, primary the end of this webinar, but before I hand over to Donald, um, I will, I, I want to ask a question and that, that is for Nilam from WHO. Um, again, thank you for joining us and for the collaboration. Um, can I ask you just what sort of input you, um, you have got from this webinar, taking back to your, uh, to your work in the WHO? So um, I, I, uh, thank you for this opportunity again. And I think uh, uh, what uh, for me, the, the whole uh, comprehensive approach to uh, patient safety and quality has been addressed uh, in this webinar. And uh, particularly with going forward with the, um, with the coronavirus pandemic still evolving in many parts of the world. Uh, and you know, till the time there is a vaccine available, which is safe and effective, this will change our lives for uh, for long, you know, for in the medium and long term to come. So, uh, innovative approaches uh, is something which really I think is a very important take uh, take home message for me. Uh, on also uh, how do we effectively and safely utilize telemedicine uh, in this uh, in this uh, journey of uh, patient care? So, it's not only about COVID patients as well. It's uh, also about patients who are who are not accessing the healthcare system as of now to build their confidence into, to assure that safety and, and uh, you know, timeliness of their treatment and make sure that in this time we have different approaches rather than what we have been you know, using, using for years uh, so far to have more newer approaches, how we can reduce the risk of infection and still uh, provide timely uh, care for patients. Diagnostic safety has emerged as one of the major challenges as well. So I think there are certain, uh, in, so this is another take um, home for me is diagnostic safety and of course medication safety. So these are like three or four areas which I think will have major impact on patient safety going forward for both for COVID as well as for non-COVID patients and health and healthcare workers as well. So while I have the floor and I just want to mention that um, uh, we also recognize in WHO the interrelationship between health workers and patients and the World Patient Safety Day, which is uh, uh, to be marked globally on the 17th of September. Uh, for 2020, the theme for this day uh, has been selected as health worker safety, a prior priority for patient safety. We, and we are actually asking for speaker for health worker safety as the main uh, call for action to all uh, stakeholders 
in patient safety. So safe health workers, safe patients is a slogan which we are giving to the world for this World Patient Safety Day because health worker safety is a priority for patient safety. Thank you. Highly appreciated from Wonka side, I can assure you. Um, okay, we, we need to be fair to everyone. So we have the last monitor to convey a question to the panel. Laura, what can you give us from the chat that you have, have seen as an important issue to address? Hi, thank you, Anna. Uh, they are asking, some people is afraid about, now that we are using telemedicine, how can we get the patient back to our office? Maybe some of the patients will prefer keep using telemedicine and we will have problems to keep them back to, to our offices. I was trying to answer that in Spain, we use telemedicine for some years before the pandemic. And usually we can ask them to come to maybe for a physical examination or just to speak face to face. And they usually have no problems about that when you give them the appointment. But what is your experience in other countries? I think this question will go to Pamendra as, as the chair of all the working party of eHealth. Unmute yourself, please. Unmute yourself. In my place, like most, uh, I have got lots of patients in my telemedicine consultation, but they do come in my OPD also. First, we select some peripheral health centers where we start telemedicine, and the person, like who is healthcare provider in that health center, they do physical examination over there. They can do that physical examination. And with their support, we used to treat that patient. But sometimes we do call that patient for extra, any, we need any extra physical examination or any investigation to do. Then we call that patient and that patient comes to our OPD. Even if we do consultation on teleconsultation on some patients, they do want to come to visit personally also. Thank you. That was, that was a good uh, end of, the, of this round. Uh, I will now hand over to Donald because you will now round up and maybe you even have a response to, to the question that was asked. So please Donald and thank you to all of you from me. Right, <clears throat> thank you very much panelists and those who have attended. I, I actually want to respond first of all to Rich who asked for one which actually connects with the digital, the question on digital and also coming back. My, my improvement for quality would be compliance, right? And that's also connectivity and the continuity of our relations with patients. So how do we achieve that? I think it's the caring attitude during digital consultations, whatever, and also sometimes proactively calling your patients, the long-term ones, and this will improve the trusted relation that we build up. And that is the most important or valuable relation between family doctors and patients. So I would think that it's the attitude and how you do it. It's not just a digital message to say, you know, come tomorrow or whatever. Start with how are you? How are things? How's the family? You know, I think the personal touch would be the one. And But you use the technology. You use the digital technology to help but anyway so so i i would think that you know improvement is compliance to make sure that during these difficult times that our patients comply okay so before i make other closing remarks i think i want to advertise next week same time uh, uh, our webinar will be on research a very big topic and we're looking forward to see you know what our coordinators have in mind i'm sure you know, overrun by three hours if we, if we go on. But anyway, thank you again. So next slide. That's right. So while the response has been magnificent of family doctors globally to the challenge of COVID-19, we should not forget that our patients will continue to have the usual range of illnesses and diseases that require quality and safe care. Some new, some chronic, some easy to treat, and others much less so. Many may be ill-defined, 
Some will even be terminal. Next, please. So we continue this year as never before to deliver health care to our patients in different, sometimes innovative ways to meet the demands and restrictions placed on communities for their own safety. As ever, we are the first in and last out professional group, serving our patients as best as we can, delivering good quality and safe primary health care. Our task now is to bring the best of who we are and what we do to a world that is more complex and more confused than any of us would like it to be. May we all proceed with wisdom and grace. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Donald, and thanks to all the panel. Um, please join us again next week, if you can, for the last in the current series of Wonka webinars, as Donald said, focusing on research. Led by Felicity Goodyear-Smith, chair of our research working party, the panel will be discussing some of the studies into COVID-19 that the working party is involved in, and also touching on some of its non-COVID activities. Um, just a reminder that the webinar will be at the earlier time of 1000 UTC. Um, so please join us at 1000 UTC next Sunday. Um, but for now, everybody, thank you again and stay safe.